This episode of Market Talk is brought to you by Growmark FS. Keeping up on the latest in ag is a challenge to say the least, but there are experts nearby ready to help. You'll find them at your local FS. You can trust them to bring you customized agronomic grain and energy solutions born of the latest thinking. That's because FS specialists receive continuous training that keeps them current on the latest trends, practices, and technologies. So you'll get local expertise that's both exceptional and up-to-date. Visit FSSystem.com to learn how FS is bringing you what's next. And joining us now here on Market Talk to discuss the trade action that we saw on Tuesday and uh, some interesting headlines late in the session to go over. We're joined by our good friend Jim McCormick, agmarket.net. And Jim, great to catch up with you again, sir. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. I appreciate being on. We're here from uh, snowy uh, northern Illinois. Got a couple inches of snow here today, folks. I think you got a few more inches than they did in Kansas City, but uh, we're in KC for the uh, Farm Broadcasters NAFB convention this week. And so uh, I'm joining you in the uh, snowy and cold weather, as uh, many folks are here this week, Jim. Well, let's, uh, let's dive in. Let's talk markets. And, you know, throughout much of Tuesday, it felt like a fairly quiet session. And then all of a sudden, I know we got news reports about missile strikes by Russia into Ukraine. And I know you were talking to me, uh, sounds like some of those even went into Poland on accident as well. Uh, so a lot of uh, questions and concerns and that kind of gave us a pop of the markets uh, pretty much across the grains, Jim, it looked like. Exactly. I mean, to start today, Jesse, we were under pressure. I think we got to make note, it does look like there was some progress being made on extending this grain corridor out of the Ukraine with the Russians. Um, you know, they've been kind of upset. The world has not been buying a lot of their grain as they've been trying to sell it. Um, the world technically, guys, is not blocking the sale of, U of Russia grain exports, but they're having a problem with the financing, plain and simple. Some of the banks who are sanctioning were, were limiting their ability to finance some of the trade deals. There's some negotiations going on that maybe some of those bank sanctions would drop, which would allow the grain to maybe flow a little bit easier out of Russia. So Russia was going to take that into account and keep that grain corridor open. And that had the market under pressure early in the session as people were saying, well, that'll, you know, that'll solve maybe some of the world's food problems. But then late in the session, um, unfortunately, there was reports that Russia had shot over 100 missiles across Ukraine, pretty much trying to hit infrastructure as they're trying to make life miserable for the Ukrainians. But unfortunately, two of those missiles went across the border and landed in, in Poland, killing two farmers. Now, Poland is one of our NATO members. And, you know, the reality is Russia just bombed a NATO member and the market reacted very violently to that, not just in the grain markets, the equity market, which was trading higher, traded lower. The energy markets kind of rallied on that news as the market's just uncertain. What does that mean to the world? But later in the session, we did back off those highs, as I think the world does realize we're probably not seeing an escalation of the war. I think most people are going to realize this probably was a situation of the missiles that the Russians are using right now, Jesse are not what you call smart weapons. They pretty much use most of their smart weapons. They're using some old technology and unfortunately one or two of them glided in and I think the world is gonna to react to it. Mm -hmm. But I'm guessing that if anything, this may put even more pressure on for the Russians to get that green corridor open as a kind of a, kind of a, I'm sorry, we uh, kind of mishit you type of situation. So, uh, but it just shows you how volatile this re world's trade reaction is to what's going on in Europe. And I was just going to ask, and you answered my question, though. I mean, you know, what does this do for the export deal? And, you know, along your line of thinking, maybe the Russians, you know, a little more pressure on them to get this done. I know it sounded like they wanted some sanctions lifted to help with fertilizer and wheat exports. And, you know, one has to wonder now what this uh, what this grain deal could ultimately look like. But as I said, you kind of answered my question there. It hopefully would presumably still allow us to get things done, Jim. We should, but the one thing we also got to remember, folks, is you know the market's being pressured, both the wheat and corn on the grain deal, with the idea that if the grain deal gets done, obviously we're going to see more competition in the United States. But the reality is what's kind of interesting, especially on the corn, let's say the deal gets done, Jesse, by our calculations and our group at, at, at um, John Stewart and Associates are saying, you're looking at maybe four or five million metric tons of corn that would be exported if this grain deal gets done. But here's an interesting fact. That's about the size of the crop that was lost in Romania this year because of the drought going on. So the reality is the world supply isn't really going to essentially change much. Essentially, you're just gonna export more Ukrainian corn potentially with a grain deal. 
and it's just going to make up some of the lost production out of Ukraine, uh, excuse me, out of Romania. And the other part we've got in the world is what's going on in Argentina. They continue to be very dry. Their crop is getting smaller by the day. How much smaller is debatable, but we do know it's getting smaller. So by our, our accounting, we're going to be looking at a relatively tight supply of grain in the world, especially as we flip the calendar into 2023. So roughly Feb, March, April, we're probably going to be the best deal in town if this Ukrainian crop, or excuse me, even with the Ukrainian exports, if the Argentina crop fails, that should drive demand back to the United States. So, uh, you know, the volatility and the export rumors are going to continue, plain and simple. Well, that export demand has been sluggish. Domestically, we've had fairly good demand. You know, I've had a few uh, few folks uh, put this question in my head, especially this corn market. I know the charts have looked rather ugly lately. We've been coming off those highs near $7, but you know, there's not a lot of corn piles across the country. And I think it goes to show just how much, you know, we were lacking in corn supply here uh, going into this harvest. And, you know, one has to wonder if uh, that supply, if, if we start to pick up some export demand, Jim, coupled with our domestic demand, what's that going to do for this corn market potentially? Well, I think potentially it could be very explosive. The reality is, Jesse, you're looking at a carryout. The government said here last week, sub 1.2 billion bushels. And the 1.2, I think, is a critical number. If you figure out the map, we usually we use roughly 1.2 billion bushels a month in exports and feed consumptions and ethanol, grind, you name it. That's where it's at. So our supply right now is projected to be less than a month's supply. And we'll see what the export number says. Like I said, I, I lean to think the export number will re rebound a little bit. The other thing we got to remember is we typically do a bulk of our shipments in the springtime, not in the fall. The fall, we tend to ship beans in the spring. Late winter, we ship corn. So there is plenty of time to see that export number start to rebound relatively quick. And like I said, if Romania crop being small, the Argentina crop being small, I think the odds are high that you will see some demand come back in the United States. But yes, the supply situation is still relatively tight. Now, the one thing I'm going to make note, you made a note that the corn market had seen a pretty good sell-off, and so had the bean market. But what have we seen in the cash market? In general, the cash market has stayed relatively strong on a very strong basis situation. So this may be a time where producers out there maybe ought to look at considering at least maybe locking in a basis contract, especially if they've got grain in commercial storage. That's one way to stop the storage charges from adding up. But the reality is history would suggest that the basis may be topping out right now because we know what's going to happen sooner or later. We're going to start seeing some free DP offers coming in. And traditionally, when the elevators start offering free DP, that does tend to be a stimulus to get the grain moving to market. And that tends to be a little bit negative basis. So producers right now might consider looking at a basis contract that would keep the market open on the futures, especially if you think the futures markets are going to rebound due to demand or just the dryness issues the United States is currently dealing with. Well, you mentioned the basis plan. I was going to ask as well, uh, just uh, thoughts risk management wise here with this current crop, corn, beans, uh, anything changed in your thinking? And, you know, as we get harvest wrapped up and producers are maybe sharpening their pencil, looking at their marketing plan, you see a day like today where we get a little bit of a pop, a little bit of a rally, uh, anything changed with your, with your marketing plans? I know on the basis side, especially if you're looking at cash, it's very regional right now, but uh, just in general, anything changed or is everything kind of holding where you've all, where you've been the last few weeks here, Jim? Well, it's, it's hanging in there. If there's one thing I would say has changed a little bit since we talked last, Jesse, it would probably be the beans. We've had a heck of a bean rally here. Um, you're trading up near 1450 on the beans. A lot of that has to do with the bean oil demand around the world, a little bit of optimism on biodiesel, which I think you have to be optimistic in the long run. But the one thing I'm very, very nervous about in the beans is this sustainable. And what I mean by that is we've seen some China buying recently. They've been in the market aggressively early in the year, then they kind of backed away. And now they've been kind of back in the market. And I think a little bit of that is they're hedging their bet, plain and simple. They're buying our U.S. beans now as kind of the waiting as their locking in needs, plain and simple. But they're also waiting to see what the South America crop looks like. I believe, unfortunately, that if South America crop is big, I think China's going to do what it's notoriously done before. You're going to see cancellations of U.S. bean sales to China, and they're going to switch that to the Brazilians. A, the Brazilians are going to sell it to them a little bit cheaper, but B, I am a little bit worried about the politics. The reality is we've been in a trade war with the Chinese since the middle of the Trump administration. Now, that trade war was just tariffs. We tariffed their stuff. They tariffed our stuff. What's a tariff? A tariff is just a tax on the imports. So essentially, we were still allowing China goods to come to us, and then we were still shipping China goods 
our goods to the Chinese, as in mostly raw products. But the prime thing we're shipping them, excuse me, were chips and chip technology. Well, President Biden a few weeks ago stopped that. He is banning the sale of chips and high-end chip manufacturing to the Chinese. And by all accounts, that is going to have a huge economic hit to the Chinese economy and their and their goals to become, you know, AI sufficient and produce their own chips. So we really haven't seen much of a pushback, I believe, from the Chinese on that. I got to believe they're going to push back eventually. You know, Joe Biden, the President Biden and Xi just had a meeting here this week. What they agree on, Jesse? They agreed that essentially it'd be very bad for the war in Ukraine to go nuclear. But that's about all we got out of that that meeting. And you know, so I guess it's good that we're not going to agree that no nuclear war. But the reality is, we still got very very frosty trade relations. And it wouldn't surprise me if you see the Chinese shift their buying away from the United States to the Brazilians as a way to kind of politically punish us a little bit, as well as take advantage of maybe a little bit cheaper beans in Brazil than from the United States. So if you're a producer of beans right now, or if you're looking at planning, potentially planting more beans into 2023, I would encourage you guys to look at a way to kind of lay off that risk, at least with options, just as a way to put a floor in the market in case I'm right and the Chinese do pivot away from the U.S. and cancel some purchases. Jim McCormick, agmarket.net, our guest today. Jim, you brought up something there as well that I was thinking about here the last couple of days, and I'll ask you to, uh, you know, look at it 23, doing some marketing there. What about even out to like 24? I mean, with such good prices out on the board uh, for producers here, if they can lock in some inputs or, or whatnot, I mean, how aggressive should people be getting with their marketing right now, Jim? I think our, our group has always tried to argue it is the profit potential versus the price. You know, when you look at where you're at, there's no doubt about it. The bushels in the east were, you know, the yields in the east were phenomenal in certain locations. And the profit margins are astronomical. And our argument would be take advantage of that. That's what the board's from. So we're actually locking in profits on this year's crop, we'd encourage you to start locking profits in in some 2023. We've, we've done some short dated options as well as some long dated stuff. And then even on the 24, we haven't had many producers go into the 24, but the reality is if you look historically, um, I'm gonna make a little bit of advertisement. If you go to our website, Jesse, we actually did a meeting yesterday and we kind of described, if you look back what happened in 08 and you look what happened in the drought year of 2012, when we put these highs in, you know, and it looks like maybe we put the high in at $8 corn this summer. We have a good crop and Brazil has a good crop. That tail is one to two years out, maybe as much as three years out. So if you're a producer and you can cash flow and you can lock in profits in 2024 and lock in some input costs and you know that you're making money, I'm always going to encourage you to take the bird in the hand and leave the, and not worry about the one in the bush. The world right now, unfortunately, is I think is very fragile on the economic side. The reality is by all accounts, Inflation is slowing down, but it's not done with. Slowing down, so going down to eight to seven. The reality is we need to get it back to two or 3%, and that's gonna take a couple of years. The Fed is saying they're gonna raise interest rates at least five to five and a half percent. By all accounts, Jesse, that's gonna put the US in, a re in recession, is what most people believe. And if we go into recession, the world's gonna go into recession. If not sooner, Europe's probably gonna go into recession this winter due to the high energy costs. Well, if you're in a recession, that's not bullish commodities, it's bearish commodities. And all of a sudden this market's gonna go down. And the one thing I like to remind people is the market doesn't owe you a profit. The market gives you an opportunity to lock in profits, but it doesn't owe you a profit. And you saw how quick the market reacted today. One minute we're trading lower based on fear of an oversupply, then the next minute we're trading higher on a bomb coming up, going off in Poland. We don't know what's gonna happen, but if you know you can lock in profit, our, our argument is you need to go ahead and lock some of that in. And I love how you put that, Jim, because I, I think for some folks, it's about changing the way they think when it comes to their marketing plan. You know, more and more, it seems like the farm is being run more like a business or should be run more like a business versus just being run as the farm. And that's kind of what we always try to, you know, bring up and encourage here on the show is that it might be about changing your thinking. Maybe you've never marketed out two years ahead, but maybe you need to think about that in an environment like this. I think that's very paramount to think about, Jim. Well, exactly. I actually was having a conversation with my customers today about this. And we said, look, you know, we tend to market stuff on price. 
what price? Seven dollar corn. What number do you want to sell your corn at? Seven. You know, producers always give us a number. My twenty five years, you know, almost. I want to sell corn at seven. I want to sell at eight. My argument to the producer right now is why seven? Why eight? What is that number? It may not be seven. You may look at where you're at. If you're in Illinois where you've had some phenomenal yields, you may be, you know, seven dollar cash corn with a strong basis, but you're locked in seventeen, eighteen hundred dollar gross. Look at the profit margin. We're the only industry that says, I want to hit a certain price, but almost everyone else in the industry sells a product based on revenue per dollar, revenue per product, revenue per widget, profit margins. I make a widget, cost me $9, I can sell it for 12, I know my profit's $3. That's what they look at. They want to just make that $3 margin. Agriculture tries to pick random points saying this is it. We want to get you to say, look, what is that profit margin? If you can lock in profit margins in 22, 23, and 24, with these levels we're locking in potentially, you're locking in generational wealth potentially. Jim, uh, before we run out of time, want to talk livestock trade on Tuesday. Uh, hogs held up well at the close. Cattle backed off, I'd have to presume, uh, with corn, and beans, wheat all moving higher. Any thoughts in this protein sector overall here as you look at the trade after Tuesday? Overall, I think it's more of a sideways choppy trade right now. I mean, I'm a little bit optimistic of livestock near term type of situation. Uh, you know, I do think I've read a lot of reports that the demand for the higher end cuts for Christmas, they're still optimistic. You're going to see a lot of a lot of consumers come in and, and, you know, try to spend that what's left of their COVID money, maybe to celebrate Christmas and all that. But I think you've got it. It's just like the grain side of the equation. I think you, if you're an agriculture producer, no matter if it's grains or livestock, if you can lock in margins, you probably should. Because the reality is, if we do go into a recession, what happens? We start laying people off. We start laying people off. The demand for protein is going to drop. The, I mean, a big thing we also remember is we export a lot of our protein. We overproduce agriculture in the United States. Our goal in the United States in agriculture is to produce for the Amer American citizen, but also produce for the world. So even if the U.S. manages to maybe dodge the bullet on you know, a recession, if Europe's going to recession, if China continues to struggle economically, you could see the price of beef go down. So it's the same argument. Look at your profit margins. If they're able to lock them in, our argument it is start locking margins in. Well, Jim, great stuff as always. I know if producers have questions, they can reach out to you and the team there at agmarket.net very easily. Go online. I know you guys have a great app, a phone call, a lot of different ways to get in touch, isn't there, Jim? Exactly. Agmarket.net's our, our website. Go to that. You can get to our app on that. Otherwise, call any of the agmarket brokers at 844-424-6758. Jim, always a pleasure, sir. Appreciate the insight. Enjoy the rest of your week, and hopefully you don't get too much more snow. You can have a few weeks without the snow there in the Chicago area. Thanks for the time. Always a pleasure. Have a great one, sir. Thank you for having me on, Jesse. I appreciate it. That's going to do it for Market Talk today. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm your host, Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.